Well, it's pretty exciting because we're getting down to that drop dead date to where I want everything to be done on the lands I hunt coming this Sunday. And then I'm leaving them alone for two weeks. We have the HuntWise crew coming out. We're gonna shoot a bunch of videos for promotion, um, information, teaching. But then uh, they're actually gonna sit in a stand with me. And then two days later, Dylan's coming out. We have a couple days of filming. We're gonna sit in a stand then too. So it's crazy to think that just in, you know, less than three weeks we'll be in the stands. And we're excited because we're getting everything wrapped up on our, our new property extension here on the land in Minnesota. We bought the 67 acres and you know, I talk about these three stands that we have out here and then we're adding three redneck blinds. We'll add another stand, tree stand location, another blind location. Um, when I come back, those are in areas that are off to the edge a little bit, but we're getting back here a long ways. It takes us a little while to get back here. And we have a beautiful stand location right up here in the oak behind me. And you can see the seat up there, but what's nice is there's a great cruising trail right below the stand right here. And it's, everything is close, compact, but because of the hill, I love hunting these hills because we can blow our scent right off the edge and not worry about anything in the morning. In the evening, we're creating all this movement up here behind the camera. This movement that's here, what we're relying on is we have this food plot out here and it's uh, doing really well. And this is an integral part because no matter what we did to the vegetation back here, you know, I see videos about, you know, we have goldenrod out here, ragweed, all great stuff during the summertime, but folks, no value during the fall during the hunting season. And you know, we have another video too that I'm gonna talk about and it might ruffle some feathers, but um, cause I want you guys to hear the truth and to actually know things that work. But you're not a deer manager unless you actually have deer to manage. So if you're managing deer from January to September outside the hunting season, February to September, whatever your, your season off season falls in, then you're not managing deer because you're not improving their health. Um, maybe down in the arid Southwest uh, locations where there's not a lot of green food during the summer, but the rest of the country, you know, 90% of the whitetail range has plenty of food during the summertime and you're not gonna make a dent in their overall health. And so where you can actually manage deer and do something good for them is during the fall and winter months. And that's when you're offering food. All the native browse and, and uh, local habitat is diminishing in value. So if I have great habitat out here, which I already do, but if I only had that, I wouldn't have the deer herd. And so if I'm not attracting, holding, advancing deer to the next age class, molding sex ratios, improving buck age structure, limiting the number of does because I can harvest them because they're here or not, I can build the herd, I can reduce the herd because they're attracted to my land, then I'm not actually managing deer. So a lot of people th confuse the two that just because you plant food plots, you work on native vegetation, you improve the local habitat. Folks, if you're not improving the herd during the fall, during the hunting season, you're not advancing that herd, you're not actually a deer manager or a habitat manager. And there's a big difference. In order to be a deer manager, you actually have to have deer during the daylight on your land, holding them, and then you can mold and shape that herd. You can actually manage the herd, not just the habitat. So this food plot appears critical because just with great habitat alone, we'll have some deer in here, but they're gonna be shared by a lot of different neighbors around here. And if they're crossing property lines, if they're crossing roads, they're going to die. So they're not gonna to get to an older age class. So we wanna have more of a compact movement. So a lot of times when I have a movement like this, I have complimentary stands. So this is one stand. Right now, we have really nice winds. It's actually northeasterly winds. It's blown right off this ridge great morning wind coming from the food sources over here so we could come into this in a morning backdoor approach through the woods we don't even have to get out here to the food plot we're down the ridge so our voice our sound our noise our access can't be seen and then where our scent is going to be completely covered we can use this for morning we can access through the food if we want to hunt here in the evening and then back out the woods after dark or we can come in here before daylight get into the stand and i want to show you how this all comes together because it's pretty cool and again we're using this food to anchor the movement here. That allows us to be a deer manager and I hope you are, you guys are too. So last night we added a new mock scrape licking tree here. Now I almost cut an oak down over here as a red oak, I almost cut it down, but we found a handy red cedar over here. We drug it over here to this location, post hole digger, bag of cement, seeding it in firmly. And we picked this red cedar because it had nice branches hanging out. But we have a, tra a deer trail that comes right out here to our beautiful food plot and we have a trail that comes right here they both come together in this location you know i talk about making sure that you can shoot to the mock scrape or don't build one 
don't put one there at all. Of course, we don't have a tree here, so we added a tree. This will be here for a couple years at least, a few years. Red cedar, they make fence posts on them. They last a long time. And then the stands right there. This is about a 23 yard shot, 24 yard shot to this location. So again, trails going that way, that way. And then look at the beautiful food plot we have up here. This was made, no tilling, no disking, no plowing. This was just all my easy no-till. If you guys look up easy no-till, you can find that. I came in here, you can see where I ran over trees, brush. We threw the seed down on the soil. This is the brassica blend over here. This is the green blend over here. You can check out my 2021 best food plot mix video. That'll give you a lot of details on this, but you can see how well it's doing. Again, no plowing disking. We've put urea on here, plot start, plot boost, and I still have plot boost to put on here, but it's great. We have a weed free food plot. You can see the corn back there. You can see the power line behind the corn. I actually have a 30 foot wide strip strip of switchgrass it's 300 yards long that allows us to get in during the daylight over there and then we can sneak out during the darkness down into the woods but these you can see the food down here it's just beautiful you know really lush green a lot of tillage radish rape oats over here we get into a lot of the the pea blends we have tillage radish oats we have a little bit of buckwheat in here so really good blends for attracting a lot of deer but this is just one stand. We'll have a redneck right there in line with that telephone pole that we can access very easily in and out. Nothing back here will even know we're gonna get in. It just sits just above the gray dogwood in the past. We're putting that in in two days. So redneck, this stand right here, and then we have another stand over here. Now on this one, I like separating my improvements, especially when it creates two different stand locations. So one thought is we put a water hole and a mock scrape here. We don't need that. I want to have separation of improvements. So I want to keep the water hole separate from this location so I can then help enhance this stand over here. This trail where they're coming out goes straight from that red cedar. And then we walk right into this location. There's already a deer trail coming out and we'll be able to back the side by side in here and fill up a water hole. And we'll add this water hole right back here in the shade so we don't have evaporation. And it's gonna be a great spot for the water hole right in here. It's a little bit open. We'll get these trees out of here. And then the stand is right there. And because it's downhill, we're almost at level with the stand. I can't tell you how many deer and bucks I've shot uphill in these areas out here because we're off to the side. Complete opposite set of winds for that right there. And then all southerly, westerly, easterly winds, we can hunt up there. The only thing we can't hunt with is a direct north wind that comes back into the plot. So other than that, we have the redneck over here we can get a lot of use out of. We have the stand location right here with a ladder stand from Family Tradition. Put a water hole here. This trail goes directly to the red cedar. Everything else funnels out to the, uh, to the food plot in this location. And then of course I'll add a mock scrape in, right in here in this location. Probably I would guess the water hole would be right up here in the open. And there's a lot of trails that converge around here. And I don't know if you guys can see the stand back there, but the seed is almost directly level with me. But we can put that water hole here. We can add a mock scrape here too. We have a really big shag bark hickory for a camera location here too. We have a camera location right here in the red cedar. So that's the way I like setting things up to where next year we can add a, a bedding area stand back on this ridge. We're gonna choose to leave this bedding area alone this year just simply because I have so many options here on the total acreage we have. It's 245 acres spread out a long ways. I have a lot of stands and a lot of locations we can take advantage of. We will add a stand back there, but we were talking, I was talking to Dylan today and he reminded me, you know, we're doing this in steps where last year we had 15, 13 stands, whatever it was, um, so redneck blinds. We had mock scrapes, water holes, the water holes this year, lots of switchgrass this year, last year, We'll trim apple trees last year because apple trees are great, but they're not gonna make or break our hunt. That's year three for us. Uh, next year, we created bedding areas this year, that's year two. So a lot coming together with these stand locations. And this is just one set. We have this stand, this stand right here, that redneck back here, all relating to this food source, this bedding area. We can tap into from either side, different access for mornings and evenings, gun stand, muzzleloader stand, back there in the redneck 
And so that's the way we're, we're holding things here and we're leaving large areas where deer can move freely and we're not spooking them. So we'll just chip away to buck back here that we have. We'll get them on camera. We'll see the rubs and scrapes and then we'll come in here and try to get a good kill. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to bring that to you, but guess what? We have another system like this on the other side of the 67 acres and we'll go take a look at that right now and i want you just guys to see how all these strategies come together especially these complementary stands if if a stand is good for one or if a location is good for one stand it's typically good for multiple stands and that allows us to chip away at a buck movement that's within that because a mature buck will slot into these small movements so we should have a mature buck or two that relates to this area one on the other side of the draw and then several locations throughout the land. So we could have literally six, seven, eight different mature buck areas. And the reason those all work is because we have the same food sources spread out over the same landscape. They're all adjacent to really good high quality bedding area. And so they create a bunch of micro movements and those micro movements don't change because the food and the value of the cover doesn't change the entire hunting season. If we didn't have food plots here, the deer would be wandering through here, be very random, They'll, they might, make it to other properties they're going to get shot they're, the buck age structure is going to be lower so ask yourself when you're putting your combinations of stands and what you're doing on your land together are you actually a deer manager or a habitat manager there's two distinct differences between the two i find most are habitat managers very few have a daylight herd that includes the older bucks in the neighborhood they can manage and that's what i try to teach you to do here let's go take a look at the ne next spot and as it relates to this entire strategy on the new 67 acres here now this is stand blind location number four that's on the new land. And, um, and this one works because of a few things. Again, we have pretty good food plot out here. We're also gonna have a blind opportunity on the food plot. We're gonna have a blind opportunity on the next food plot over. The reason these deer are here in this location and filling in these bedding areas is because of the food plot we were at to begin with and then these over here. So then we have bucks right now that are using this to a pretty good degree and they keep increasing in number. You know, we're already into September 1st is tomorrow. So it's here and we notice the deer starting to make that annual shift. They really start shifting the end of this month. So Dylan's already seeing hard, hard horn on some of the, the bucks on the property that he uh, hunts on. So I'm sure there's some out here like that too. They're already shedding their velvet. But this stand right here again works because of everything we're doing. And we even passed all the way down the bottom. Um, we have a redneck location that we're going to put in the bottom where all these points come together. And because the food's up here, because of what we're doing up here in the top, then those bucks are down at the bottom and that connects to the rest of our land too. So you can see back here, we have a stand location right here, one of the family traditions hang-ons and, and uh, ladder stick is right up in the red cedar. And so completely hidden. And again, we're coming in here, there's a great morning spot because we can access from all the way down to our lower trail system. We can park up there, get down to here very easily and quietly. We can come up and then we come straight up to the stand for morning. And so we're not walking near those food sources. We're walking in between all our food plots within 150, 200 yards on either side. We can come in this middle trail that cuts all the way down the bottom. That's, all, that's how we access that last morning stand. But instead of going all the way to the bottom and across, we just come up here behind these oaks and sit down. So up here, we've installed water hole in this spot right here. And then of course our mock scrape location. And this has been up here for a while. We're getting decent buck pictures, but we expect the action to really heat up. And what's cool about this, we have a lot of trails that crisscross down below the stand and uh, cruising trails. So they might not necessarily be up here, but they'll be down there. But you can bet certainly we're, we're at right here. We're about 24, 25 yards, 25, 26 yards to the water hole. And I like that because we're not right on top of it, but certainly great cover. And uh, let's go check out these food plots, how they're doing it. Again, these food plots, no tilling, disking, plowing of any kind, just spraying, opening up the soil in my easy no-till uh, process. And they're looking incredible. And so we'll take you on to some of these other setups, but I hope you can see how this is coming together. And again, it's not about one stand location in one spot. It's how can we make a combination of tree stands that we can use for morning, evening, different access routes that all chip away at the same buck movement. I consider this a different buck movement than the buck movement we were just at a little while ago. And for those that tell you that bucks have a three mile home range, they do after dark. Very few people get to experience a daylight parcel where mature bucks are focusing on their land during the daylight or the area they hunt because they don't have that season long food source. They don't have that season long cover. You can't have one without the other. Again, you can't have great habitat without great food plots. And when you do, 
then you shrink those daylight movements of mature bucks. We've seen that time and time again. It's really hard to complete a scientific study on small properties like that because bucks move so far. Most people are hunting poorly, spooking deer off their land. I want you guys again to be deer managers, not habitat managers, and, and there's a big difference. And so we're showing how we piece this all together, how we can have these complementary stands, combined stands, and let's go check out the next spot. Now, including the redneck blind location down the bottom that we're going to have, we're gonna call that a cruising, uh, rut cruising blind location. Deer season all day, gun season sit on opening day. We can't wait to use that down the bottom. And that redneck's gonna give us a little bit more protection with swirling winds. Uh, just keeping one window open and trying to limit our winds. You can't totally eliminate it, but at least it'll, it'll cut down at it. But this, a lot of these stand locations are happening up here on the top. You know, this is number six. We were at number five over there with the water hole and scrape. The rednecks down the bottom and number four, the three on the other side. But this sixth one here and a lot of these other ones, especially four and five, are here because of these food plots that we're offering. It's a consistent movement every single day. And again, this is the easy no-till. You can see where you have to drive through to get out to the point. But this brassica is doing exceptional. It's only got about five, six weeks on it. We still have to put some plot boost on it and, uh, and get it even greener. We'll add some urea too to increase the nitrogen, but this is doing excellent. We have light buckwheat in here. The buckwheat has uh, peas, tillage radish, some oats, and then we'll top dress this with rye later. But it's so thick right now, I'm wondering if you're going to top dress it with a rye, because even that rye is shade tower, but it can't take total shade which is what we're offering right here. There's so much food and green here. So because of these food pots, we're getting that consistent attraction every single day. And we have a giant apple tree over here that's on the edge of the property as the deer are going out to the ag fields. And so with this apple tree, it creates a really defined point. We can add a scrape there. We can add a camera in that location and see what's going in and out of this. And we can come in, what's the beauty of this, you can see the old trailer and junk that's on the property that has to be cleaned up by the previous uh, owners. But we can sneak in on this side. We have two trails, one up by the field, one down in the woods. We can use the trail down in the woods to access in the morning or depart after dark in the evening when the deer are already clearing through and getting into the fields. In the afternoon, we can go right along the field edge to get in here or out late morning out of a stand. I'd like to stick a stand right in here. We're looking, considering one of our redneck ghillie blinds, um, maybe even a pop-up but bottom line is that camper right there that old camper it's starting to look more and more inviting <laughs> for actually sitting in I don't know uh, we probably have some mice to kill maybe some snakes whatever I'm not sure what else is living in there bees hornets but you can see the window right there which would probably be the dining room window or whatever it you can see a window that looks out at the apple tree and then looks out at this plot i'm thinking we could black it out in there maybe put some brush in front of it to make it hidden but the deer are used to it you can see the pile of vines on this side so i'm thinking we could actually use that what are you thinking dylan i'm all for it yeah you wouldn't mind sitting in there would just stove still works i'll make breakfast <laughs> yeah that sounds good <laughs> but uh you know this sets up this movement right here this garbage right here is it's been here for a long time the deer are used to it but uh, we can sneak in and out of here get in and out very well and again it's a complimentary stand meaning that's a morning stand definitely back there this is more slanted to evening although we could get in here in the morning just for that first hour to see if deer are sneaking back in here and that leads us to stand or blind location number seven at the next little plot over here and so i like the combination here because on the other side we're hunting near food, but we're back in the woods in a couple stand locations. We're in this morning stand back in the woods right here on the point, and then the redneck in the bottom. So we have four stands that are more back in the woods. And then we have these blind locations, especially these two on this side that we can use for morning or evening. And we can use some blinds that are hidden in goldenrod, ragweed, gray dogwood shrubs, maybe even a camper here, an old camper. I think after we're done, we might go check it out. I've never even checked it out. I guess I own it now that I own the land, but uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But uh, we're gonna go check out uh, blind number seven over here, blind and stand location number seven. But uh, you know, again, September 1st tomorrow, and we're well on our way to having everything finished on this property. We'll show you all those pieces throughout the hunting season too. And I don't know if we'll show a complete map. Um, maybe we'll do that at some point, especially in the off season. But we're gonna show you all these pieces, hunting from these stands, the deer movement by them. 
and how this all fits together. But again, we're assembling small little micro movements and then we're chipping away at those from the outside with morning stand locations back in the woods, evening stand locations near the food or on the way to food. We're using mock scrapes, water holes. We can put a mock scrape right under that apple tree. Dylan, what do you think? 20 yards from that camper, right around there. So pretty good. We have great access behind all this garbage. And uh, so let's go check out number seven. We'll complete that. And um, I think I'm gonna go actually look around in that camper for a second. Security's tight. Jeez. Well, this is our seventh and final location. And, uh, and again, we have the food here, so that supports the movement. And with the food, what we're doing is creating micro movements where there's different bucks here, different bucks right over there. They all relate to separate bedding areas here. Offer food, we have does bedding near these food sources and then bucks do bedding down in the ravine in this case. Could be that it's going uphill or downhill, doesn't really matter. Bucks don't prefer to bed high or low. It's all based on food. So if we have food here, there's going to be does, then there's going to be bucks. Doesn't matter if it's uphill, downhill, or what direction. And so in that way, because we're having consistent food sources that are all the same spread out, we have the big corn over there, but all our green blends are the same in all our plots. We have corn spread out from front to back, five different locations, six and a half acres of corn, and then we have the nine acres of green to complement that. So in these cases right here, they're hitting the food. That means we fill those bedding areas. That means if we fill those bedding areas, we have morning stand locations, and then we have evening stands or afternoon stand locations. This would be a great stand because we're going to be able to come into this location through this brush right here. This will all be switchgrass next year. And then we're putting a redneck blind in this crust, cluster of gray dogwood. We'll hollow out this dogwood right here. We'll put the blind into the dogwood. We have a 10 foot stand and then we'll be able to hunt this food plot with a bow or a gun. We're trying to get the most value out of our rednecks. They're a real big investment, not only for purchasing, but just for getting in and getting them set up. And so we'll access straight through here. And does it make sense? We're using the, this big pile of gray dogwood to shield our access. So we're coming in through this brush right here. We're sneaking in right to the back of the redneck and we won't be able to see the bulk of this food plot until we actually get into the redneck and look out. So that's stand number seven, blind number seven location. And because of the food, we have all these different setups on the 67 acres here. And this is what we've done times three or four, ex uh, extending over to our other uh, parcel and some of our new water hole setup stand locations. The stand locations we had last year, like the one I shot Kermit from, the blind we shot blade from, the redneck location where Diane shot two bucks from last year. The spot where Dante shot his buck. So we have a lot of spots like this set up throughout the entire parcel. It's all based on access, getting in and out, but it's all based on these complimentary stand locations, making sure that if we have bucks using these little micro movements, and again, if we're not changing the food, we're not blowing out the bedding areas, then these bucks slide in, slot into these small little daylight windows. The reason they're slotting into these small locations, why you can hold a lot of mature bucks you can hold their attention for that daylight activity during the hunting season is simply because they have very short windows of movement during the daylight. Think about it, a mature buck in an average area. Now wilderness areas, big woods, not a lot of deer. He might move a lot further during the daylight. Northern Ohio, Northern Indiana, Southern Michigan, Southern Wisconsin, Northern Illinois, big flat open areas where there's not a lot of cover. They'll move very short distances because you pack a lot of deer into small areas of cover. They have the luxury of food, not the luxury of cover. So you pack a lot of small, a lot of deer into a small area. But the average mature buck movement during daylight, what I see is anywhere from two to 400 yards. So think about that. They're only moving two to 400 yards all season long. So if you give them the food, you give them the bedding, you give them quality food, quality bedding that's consistent, they'll stay there and focus on that all year long. What we find is if you shoot a mature buck, another one from the area will slot in because it's that competitive for these little micro movements. So we can fill small parcels. This is 67 acres, it attaches to 38, it attaches to 110, but they're all these little separate parcels like this. And within these parcels, we have separate movements. 
and then we have ways that we can capitalize on those movements for daylight, morning stand movement, back to bedding areas, and then afternoon food source movement. Sometimes we have that X of movement. We have a couple of these stands out of seven that we could probably use for an all day sit. But even then, depending on the time of the year, there's going to be a higher priority put on those stand locations for morning or evening based on the buck movement at the time at those locations. We're watching it all with mock scrapes, water holes and cameras on those. And you can see, you can see our red cedar tree out there. It's actually turning a lot more red and rust colored right now because it's dead. We actually transplanted it. And when you cut the roots off, there's a strange thing, they actually die. So we use a post hole digger. We did that on the other one just in the last day. Did one last night. And we're digging a, using a post hole digger, digging that hole, putting that cedar in the ground, putting about a 50 pound bag of concrete around it, tamping it down with the end of the shovel, putting dirt over it, or dragging it into place with the side by side. And we've had incredible buck movement here. Even last night, we had good buck movement on this. So we're gonna go grab the card, check out the scrape locations under that red cedar. But this is standard blind location number seven. We'll add a couple more next year, but this will make this property very huntable this year, give us some high quality spots. And when you add it to the other 12, 13 spots throughout the rest of the land, then uh, we have more than enough options and blinds uh, to make our uh, dreams come true this year and have a great hunt. Can't wait to bring it to you, but I hope this makes sense how we're combining all these movements. They all intersect, they all uh, relate to each other, and, uh, but they wouldn't be here without the food, they wouldn't be out here without the good cover. And we're trying to teach you, we're trying to do the same to actually be a deer manager this fall and not just a habitat manager. Learn the difference, there's a big difference between the two. And uh, most people are just habitat managers but if you're managing a daylight herd that includes older bucks in the area on your land during the fall, then you're also a deer manager, deer manager, and that's what we expect, not only out of ourselves, but out of you and the content that we create to try to make you a better deer manager for this fall and beyond. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.